ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه يا رب لك الحمد دائما وابدا حمدا يوافي مزيد نعمائك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله واحد أحد فرد صمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله وما كان الله ليعذبهم وأنت فيهم وما كان الله معذبهم وهم يستغفرون من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له ومن يتوكل على الله فإن الله على كل شيء قدير ومن يستغفر الله فإن الله غفور حليم أما بعد Brothers and sisters, committed Muslims. An individual Muslim is a human being that at times builds up a storage of dedication and expense a long period of dedication and motivation but then a human being an individual human being has his lapses, his moments of weakness, the temptation to step out of the fray, this is human nature that we all share. And the Qur'an and Allah Jalla wa'ala responds to this. And this was this type of nature as it displays itself was around during the time of Allah's Prophet. There was an area outside of al Medina where there was shade, there was water, there was comfort and serenity. And Al Medina, the society of Medina at this time was in the midst of hostilities expressed from all directions. Medina became the political, the psychological, the economic, the 
the military, the social target of everyone else practically in the world. And after these combined policies and these coordinated strategies, after years and years of their effect on the human psychology that we all share, there's bound to be an individual or some individuals who would say, look, I need a break from this. I can't take this anymore. And true, there was a person who came to Allah's Prophet and said, after contemplating, looking at what is going on, how long are we going to take this? I need a breather. I have to step out of this. And the discipline of, the, of a Muslim character could not do what human nature tempts him to do before going to Allah's Prophet and asking him permission to go to a shaded, watered, comfortable, serene area away from the challenges, the awkward circumstances, the threats, the military encirclement of al Medina. And he goes to Allah's Prophet and he asks him, can I, may I, distance myself from this social pressure that we are all in. There's a place, and he referred to this place outside of Al-Medina, where I can go for a break. And I'm going to quote to you Allah's Prophet's response, not only to one individual, and not only to the relapse of human nature, but to everyone and every inclination of this type within similar circumstances until the end of time. He said to him, La tafal. Don't do it. فَإِنَّ مَقَامَ أَحَدِكُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى أَفْضَلُ مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ فِي بَيْتِهِ سَبْعِينَ عَامًا The status of one of you on a course of struggle towards Allah, the Exalted, is pref much preferable than a person praying in his own dwelling for 70 years. أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Do you not love for Allah to forgive you? وَيُدْخِلَكُمُ الْجَنَّةِ And to have you enter into al-jannah. أُغْزُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Embark on military campaigns for the sake, for the cause, and in the direction of Allah. 
من قاتل في سبيل الله وجبت له الجنة whoever is engaged in a combat effort for the sake and cause of Allah then al-jannah is due to him al-jannah is his right now remember we are speaking about human nature and human nature needs a breather from time to time if you have been listening closely to the sequence of these khutbas on Fridays you will have understood that the exertion that is required from us from time to time may drive some individuals into depression or may cause some individuals to give up this is not the character of those who are committed to Allah within circumstances that need the confluence of our efforts and the reinforcement of our struggle you need a break there are social ties that permit that type of break but there are other social times that do not permit this type of contemplation when we need each other what is your excuse I can't take it anymore if everyone was going to entertain that type of thinking and that type of attitude we will never have an Islamic consolidated effort to repel the aggression that comes our way remember Muslims were not out aggressing against people as we see in today's world there are forces and alliances and economic and political and military structures that are out to get us leave us alone if the social atmosphere was that of leaving the Muslims alone then this human nature that wants to take a break may contemplate something like that but when we have the militaries of the world around Medina and the survival of the committed Muslims and the leadership of the Muslims is at stake and then we have some individual saying I need to leave this I need to step out of this Islamic social reality the Prophet of Allah gave that person and every person with those types of breakaway ideas or passive attitudes he gave them a response says la tafal do not do it and then the ayah that shelters this hadith there's an ayah in Surah At-Tawbah in which Allah Jalla Sha'nuhu says Aja'altum Siqayat al-Hajj Wa'imarat al-Masjid al-Haram Kaman amana billahi wal yawm al-akhiri wa jahada fi sabi'il Allah La yastawuna inda Allah Wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimin الذين آمنوا وهاجروا وجاهدوا في سبيل الله بأموالهم وأنفسهم 
أولئك أعظم درجة عند الله وأولئك هم الفائزون Other Muslims may come and entertain their conscience. They may say, serving the pilgrims and building the masajid are acts of virtue that satisfy their conscience. And once again, if the social atmosphere was as lax as to accommodate these good acts, then there is an argument for this type of statement. But when we have Wars, wars, combat, battles, fighting. When we have all of that around us, you're going to satisfy yourself by saying, I'm going to build a masjid, or I'm going to take water to the Muslims in the Hajj. The response, just like Allah's Prophet gave a response to a weakling individual or temptations of a weak character. Allah gave a response to those who dislocate themselves emotionally and mentally from the reality that we are in. أَجْعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِ وَعِمَارَةَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ كَمَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَجَاهَدَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لَا يَسْتَوُونَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Do you put on a par with each other those who offer water to the pilgrims and who physically build Al-Masjid Al-Haram, the holy sanctuary in Mecca? Do you place these types of individuals on a par with those who are committed to Allah and struggle for Allah? And the answer to that is, if anyone is confused as to the answer, the answer is in Allah's plain words. لا يسكرون عند الله in the eyes of Allah, they are not equal. They are not on a par. They are not similar to each other. Wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al And Allah does not guide people who do injustice to themselves. What is this injustice we are speaking about? This injustice is the public perception that people who bring water to the attendees of the Hajj in Mecca and people who physically build Al-Masjid Al-Haram to try to have them as Good as those who are committing them, their lives to Allah and shedding their blood for Allah. You come to tell me these are equal to those 
This public perception is an act of injustice. والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين. This is not Muslims going out and occupying other people's lands. This is not Muslims stealing the revenue of their own budgets. This is only a mental public perception that has been registered in the book of Allah as an act of zulm. If only we had Muslims listening to what Allah Jalla wa Ala is saying. Therefore we understand now, we can understand why there is a world of hostility towards Muslims. With this type of understanding, Muslims cannot be indifferent. No one can come to a Muslim and tell him, oh well there's so much corruption in this world, it's better for you to go and pray in your masjid. It's enough for you to go and offer your salah in your masajid. That should do it. People who are on top of things, who have studied Islam, more than the Muslims have studied their own Islam, they know that the true understanding of Allah and His Prophet makes Muslims active. They want Muslims to be either inactive or reactive. Both ways is fine with them. But if Muslims become proactive, that's the danger. If, if Muslims begin to take their own affairs into their own hands, then they are dangerous. They begin to call us terrorists. Not because we are terrorists, obviously. We know we are not. But the fact is, there is in the air a sense of terror that they feel. And we begin to understand why. Because when Muslims combine their morality to their power, that scares them. You can be a moral Muslim as much as, as much as you want, provided according to their standards and their strategies, provided your morality has no power to it. If that defines you as a Muslim, then they will support you with everything they have. And they will honor you. And they will speak good about you. And they will present you in their media and on their talk shows and everywhere they can. Because a Muslim who has those types of morals and doesn't configure in the element of power be becomes a subject of theirs. He no longer is a subject of Allah. And then, equally so, they are satisfied with Muslims who toy and dally with the idea of power but they are disconnected from their Islamic moral standards. We've had Muslims in this world, the 
secular types who are given power. And look how they've been behaving in the past 100 years. They have proven, they have a record that shows that they also are not the subjects of Allah, but the subjects of those earthly superpowers that give them the military hardware, the protection, and the security that they need. And these types, they are also supportive of The ones that they are not supportive of are those Muslims who can combine the elements of morality with the elements of power in their hearts, in their minds, in their society. This becomes scary. That's why they feel terrorized. Because they can't deal with this type of Muslim. These are no longer Muslims who are seeking power and throwing God out of their lives. And these are no longer Muslims who are obsessed with a God who has no power to Him. These are different types of Muslims. And therefore, there's this terror that they feel. And they want this, they want to spike, they want to spike this terror and come back to us and make us feel guilty that we have finally found Allah in the moral power that we have and in the powerful morality that we have. This has become right now a guilt factor in many Muslims who want to step outside of Islam. Now they want to find a refuge away from this struggle. If it's a Sufi retreat, if it's a new trend of Sufism, in the United States and in the West, that is a way of stepping out of this struggle and this jihad. These are the plans that are being cooked for the coming decade and the coming generations. And we don't believe for one moment that they are going to be able to implement this plan because as much as they are trying to sponsor Rufi Sufis in this country and in other countries as much as they are trying to replace their old program that they worked out through their Saudi connections in the last 30 years. The fact of the matter is that they are recruiting by the millions Muslims who have found Allah and therefore the taqwa of Allah comes before any of these escapist routes that they are plotting and planning for all of us. It's too late for them. And they confess to this. They said that their intelligence services were sleeping throughout the past couple of generations. They didn't have their deep down inside informers and spies when Islam was germinating among the dispossessed and the displaced and the Muslims who lacked power and wherewithal throughout all of these 50, 60 past years. 
They were busy in their sideshow of communism versus capitalism. They consumed themselves in this managed political division of the world. And in the meantime, Allah subhanahu had other plans and he had another strategy for the Muslims who now in the tens of millions are the target of their warfare. So they have two fronts now. They have a front, a war front that is recruiting millions of Muslims to the cause of Allah. The struggle for Allah and they have this petty chain here, change here in which they are trying to recruit individual Muslims maybe hundreds into their sponsored Sufi orders of the future this is not to speak ill of a tasawwuf or Sufism we said this before and we are going to say it again we said just like the imperialist regime in Washington and the Zionist regime in Tel Aviv just like they were comfortable using the Saudi regime and its Salafi extensions all around the world and they got nowhere using that route except to divide Muslims and some of them coming out and accusing other Muslims of Kufr therefore justifying the shedding of Muslim blood and then the close supervision of Islamic activities in the West in the past 30 or 40 years. When that got them nowhere, now they are changing track. Now there's a no, new show in town. And just like in the context of the Salafis, there were sincere individuals misled by their superiors who could not break from the Saudi government or regime, who could not break from the American government or regime, who could not break from a shaitan and his plans now you are at the vantage point of seeing how they are beginning this effort all over again and now they want to absorb innocent Muslims there, are, there were innocent Salafis in the past now there's going to be innocent Sufis in the present and the future who also are going to listen to their superiors who go all the way back to the imperialists and Zionist thinking tanks or else why give them a forum why give them the opportunity to speak in public and the answer is obvious because they are part of the larger plan And if any of you have been disheartened by this it's because you are more affiliated and you have more affinity to the gravity of this world than you are to the attraction of Allah. The goodness in your heart can bring about the desired change 
a spark can begin a fire. A spark of Iman to the power, presence of Allah can bring about the divine alternative to this world of a mess that it has become. And to relate to you a hadith Qudsi. Allah and His Prophet said, وَأَنَا عِنْدَ ظَنِّ عَبْدِي بِي Allah is saying, I am where the expectations of my subject are. وَأَنَا مَعَهُ حِينَ يَذْكُرُنِي I am with him or her when they are conscious of me. This consciousness of Allah and His power is what has been absent and lacking in our lives. Therefore we go either the imperialist way in the 30 past years or we're going to go in the imperialist way in the coming 30 years. فَإِنْ ذَكَرَنِي فِي نَفْسِهِ ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي نَفْسِي If my conforming subject is conscious of me in his self, I am conscious of him in myself. Now you Muslims who have been fooled by the glitter finances or military powers what more do you want than Allah's statement if you are conscious of him in yourself he is conscious of you in his self the wording is if he mentions me in the privacy of his life, I will mention him in the privacy of mine. وَإِنْ ذَكَرَنِي فِي مَلَئٍ ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي مَلَئٍ خَيْرٍ مِّنْهِ And if he mentions me in a public if he, is, if he is conscious of me in a public, I am conscious of him in a public that is better than that. Imagine how many Muslims are incapable or inferior as to be unable to be conscious of Allah in public. Why? Because that contradicts the mainstream understanding of God. You have to internalize God for that God to be the God of the powers of this world. You can't go public with Him. And Allah is saying if you go public with Him, He will go public with you in a, setter that is, in a setting that is better than that one. That is better than that public. فَإِنْ ذَكَرَنِي فِي مَلَئٍ ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي مَلَئٍ خَيْرٍ مِنْ وَإِنْ اقترب إلي شبرا اقتربت إليه ذراعا. If this conforming subject of mine approaches me, the width of a hand, 
I will approach him the extent of an arm وإن اقترب إلي ذراعا اقتربت إليه باعا and if he comes to me with a stretch of an arm I come Allah says I come to him with the stretch of both arms وإن أتاني يمشي أتيته هرولة and if he comes to me walking I come to him running you can't approach Allah when you are passive when you are indifferent when you are isolated when you are inactive when you are reactive all of these are conditions that place you off of bounds when it comes to Allah you cannot access Allah through those attitudes and those behaviors whether you're an individual or an organization or a congregation or a movement it's a contradiction in terms how can we speak about Islamic movements how can you be an Islamic movement when you are indifferent indifference doesn't generate movement how can you be an Islamic movement when you're passive passivity doesn't generate movement how can you be, how can you have a movement when you're in isolation? How can you have a movement when you are inactive or reactive? It is impossible. It goes against the nature of things. Our hope and our expectation is that we relocate Allah into our thoughts of power in this world within the larger program that Allah has given us so that when we have power and we exercise power we do it with the limitations and with the license that Allah has given us. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم أدعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم. الله بجميع المحامد على جميع النعم صلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Brothers and sisters committed Muslims The ayah that was quoted in the first khutbah Ajaltum sifayat al-hajj wa imarat al-masjid al-haram Kaman amana billahi wal yawm al-akhir Wa jahada fi sabiil Allah La yastawuna inda Allah Allahu la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimin Allah in this ayah is telling us how dare, how dare we equate those who offer the services of the times of Hajj 
to the pilgrims who go there how dare we equate them with those who are sustaining a commitment and a struggle for Allah you know what that means in today's words if you want a tafsir of this ayah how dare you Muslims equate the regime in Saudi Arabia with the Islamic resistance in Palestine and in Lebanon that's what this ayah means in today's world how dare you say that these people who are, and these people in Arabia this is giving them a bushel of a doubt if we come and say that they are offering services they are offering nourishment or they are offering a physical construction of al Bayt al Haram they are dwarfing al Bayt al Haram they have high rises now around al Bayt al Haram they are destroying the Islamic history around al Bayt al Haram they come to the house of Abi Bakr and they want to build there I don't know some type of business ventures it could be a Starbucks it could be a McDonald's it could be whatever it is the house of Abi Bakr does not count anymore Starbucks and McDonald's are more important how do we have some Muslims saying that these are the protectors of the two harams when they are the destroyers of the two harams physically and mentally and psychologically how can this be done how can this be said how can any Muslim with a fiber of Iman in them how can they equate these two together the Saudis are politically sleeping in bed with the Kuffar and the Mushrikeen and the other Muslims as the expression has it their blood is going to burst out of their hands for the cause and the struggle of Allah we are a people who are guilty of this volume because there's a public perception that equates the religiosity of these Saudi criminals with the dedication and sincerity of the Hezbollah fighters and this war is on every front and the Saudis and their comrades in Khiana in treason they come crying to their masters in Washington DC you have to do something about this the news items they have they say Hezbollah has tripled its fighting capability from two years ago when during this time the Israelis were being defeated by the first fighting force in the Holy Land we are guilty of this one those Muslims around us who think for a moment that there's something Islamic about the about the treacherous regime in Riyadh and in Jeddah don't they read the Quran أَجَعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِ وَعِمَارَةَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ كَمَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَجَاهَدَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لَا يَسْتَوُونَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ if we're going to maintain this false and misleading perception we are called Al-Qawm Al-Zalimeen and Allah is not going to guide Al-Qawm Al-Zalimeen listen to him listen to what he has to say and understand his words and understand how they relate to, the, to today's real world اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه 
وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد ربنا صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وآل محمد ربنا صل وسلم وبارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكفر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة